Hungarian folk tales. The Little Swineherd. Once upon a time, over oceans deep and mountains high, there lived a poor woman who had a son, and his job was to look after the pigs. No matter what his mother tried to get him to do, it was always the same. There was nothing he could do right or proper, not even if you turned him into an angel. He was good for nothing at all. So anyway, this good-for-nothing of a little swineherd heard that the king would give his daughter's hand to anyone who could hide away so well that she couldn't find him. Now then, swineherd, my lad, he said to himself, roll your sleeves up for there's a lot to win if you go about it the right way. So he gathered everything up, baked himself a satchel of scones, put on his heavy cape and off he went. He walked and he walked through bushes and trees, over hill and dale, and still he couldn't find the castle of the king. For a long week he walked, ate the last of his scones, and still he didn't see a thing. And then he became so thirsty that his tongue hung out like a slipper out of a dog's mouth. Then as he went along, he came upon a well, and on it, perch two white doves. Well then, the pair of you, I'll have to eat you both because I'm very hungry indeed. Oh, don't eat us, little swineherd. Draw us some water. We're so thirsty. And one good deed deserves another. And they begged him and begged him not to make a meal of them. So he went and drew up a bucket of water for them, and he himself drank his fill of the cold, sweet water. And so he continued on. But now he was so hungry that his stomach rattled like a dog on a chain. Then he came across a lame fox. Well then, lame fox, I'll have to eat you, I'm so hungry. The lame fox beseeched him not to make a meal of him. One good deed deserves another little swineherd. I'll be able to help you. The swineherd's eyes were popping out of his head with hunger, but he decided not to eat the lame fox. He staggered on and on, and staggered to the right, and staggered to the left, and thought he'd never come to his journey's end. Then, far off, he saw a great lake. Down he went to its shore and saw a little fish struggling at the water's edge. Quick as a flash, he tickled it out of the water. Oh, please don't eat me, little swineherd. I'll repay you for your good deed. The little swineherd looked at the fish, and beautiful it was too its scales all shiny and gold. He felt sorry for the fish and put it back into the water. On he went and eventually came upon another well and on it perched two other white doves. Do you think I'm a madman? As sure as the sky above me, I'm going to make a meal of you both. So he tried to catch hold of the doves, but they begged and beseeched him not to do them harm. And the end of it was that he did them no injury but drew them water, drank a great bellyful himself, and went on his way. Not long after that, he found himself at the castle, and at the gate stood the king. So what brings you to this far off land, said the king. So the little swineherd told his tale and why he had come, that he had heard that the king would give his daughter's hand to someone who could hide away so well that she couldn't find him and that's what he wanted to try. Fair enough, my lad, said the king, but have you seen the 99 heads up there? Yours will be the hundredth if you can't hide yourself well. The little swineherd looked around and turned to the king and bravely said, I'll do the best I can, your highness. On the following morning, the king came to him and told him to hide himself away before his daughter arose. The little swineherd made himself ready and what did he see? but the two white doves. Come on, we'll take you away. And the two white doves carried him off to hide him behind the sun. The princess prepared herself for the day. She went down to the garden, plucked the finest of the roses and twirled around. Out you come, little swineherd. There you are, behind the sun. And the little swineherd was furious and frightened. 
What could he do? Out he came from the far side of the sun. The next day dawned bright and clear. The little swineherd rose, looked out of the window, and there he saw the lame fox rearing up, waiting to take him away to the end of the world. The princess went down to the garden, plucked the finest of the roses and twirled around. Out you come, little swineherd. Come back from the end of the world. And the little swineherd was forced to reappear. On the third day, he went off to meet the little fish at the lake, and the fish took him deep, deep down into the water. Not a living soul comes here. They'll never find me here. But the princess went down to the garden, plucked the finest of the roses, twirled around once, and called the little swineherd from out of the bottom of the lake. That's surely the end of me. My head will be on the hundredth stake, said the little swineherd. He laid himself down to go to sleep, but all he did was toss and turn, writhe and wriggle. On the following day at dawn, he saw two white doves at the window. One of them flew off instantly, but the other one stayed. Come as quick as you can. You'll be turned into a fine rose, and so will I. And that's what happened. By mid-morning, all the buds had blossomed in the garden. Down came the princess. She looked for the finest of the roses and found two of the same beauty. She plucked both of them and fastened them to her dress. Then she twirled around once, but she didn't see the little swineherd. She twirled around twice and still she didn't see him. Father, I can't see the little swineherd. He's hidden himself away so that I can't catch him. He can't have, just twirl around once more. So she twirled around once more for the third time, but she could have twirled around till day was done and still she wouldn't have caught the little swineherd. Then one of the roses on her dress turned into a dove and the other into the little swineherd. My heart's delight, my only love, I will be yours and you will be mine. Nothing in this world will part as ever. And they embraced and kissed and clung together like a bunch of flowers. Soon there was a wedding feast and everyone was invited. And the swineherd king and his beautiful queen lived happily ever after. Hungarian Folk Tales The Cursed Castle Once upon a time, long ago and far away, there lived a poor woman who had a daughter. They were both so very poor that they had to live in a crumbling house and that was all they had. One day the old woman fell ill and she called to her daughter. My sweet darling daughter, I am sure I shall soon die. I have nothing to leave you, so you should go, find work as a servant and try to live as best you can. And with that, she closed her eyes and died. She was buried by the people of the village because her daughter had no money to pay for the funeral. All she had was a blanket. So she took her blanket and off she went to see the world. From time to time she tried begging for food or shelter, but nobody ever gave her anything. The people said, you're strong enough to find work, which was true, but the girl was lazy. She found shelter in a garden and stayed there until summer passed. Then, when autumn came, she hid in sheds and barns and stables. One fine day she arrived in a town and it was there that she heard that the king had a castle for sale. The castle would be sold to the person who would not haggle or bargain but pay the price on the spot. So the girl thought to herself, I will buy that castle. I'll lie and say that I have the asking price. And she did exactly that. She went up to the king telling him that she would buy the castle. 
Well, well, said the king. The king has as many windows as there are days in the year, and as many doors as there are days, and rooms as there are months, and that is why the price to pay is 365 florins, no more, no less. If you can pay up without bargaining, the castle will be yours. There will be no bargain, your majesty. I do not have the money with me now, for many debtors owe me this amount. But I promise to pay you back as soon as I get my money, and all you have to do is set a deadline. Very well, young lady. Let us agree on 365 days. Very well, she thought. That is exactly one year from now, and even if they hang me after that, on my dying day, I will be able to tell everyone that I slept in a real royal castle. The king gave her the keys, and the girl walked up to her new room. Once she was there, she inspected all 12 rooms, one by one. Then she locked the door and placed one half of her blanket on the floor and used the second half to cover herself. All of a sudden, she heard something that sounded like a meowing cat. Meow, meow. Poor cat, you must be as lonely as me. So she got up and let in the cat. It was a horribly fat black cat. Come over here. Come on, lie next to me and start purring into my ear. Then at least I won't feel lonely. The cat cuddled up next to her and purred so sweetly that the girl fell fast asleep. When she woke around daybreak, she couldn't find the cat anywhere. She reached for the key which was under her head where she put it. The door was locked, the windows were closed. How could the cat have left the room? Well, anyway, if you've left, you've left. You surely know how. When evening came, she laid down once again. The cat returned once more, and so she asked it. Where have you been? How did you get out? But the cat just started meowing, and as it opened its mouth, a magnificent diamond rolled onto the floor. The girl picked it up, turned it around in her hand, not knowing quite what it might be. Finally, she put the stone into a pot and pulled the cat next to her. The cat started purring, and the girl fell asleep. This continued for a month and a day. Just wait, I'm going to find out about that cat, the girl thought. And she did exactly that. When the cat appeared in the evening, she stroked it gently with loving care. The cat put down the gemstone from its mouth and the girl placed it in the pot. The cat started purring to send the girl to sleep, but this time the girl only pretended to slumber. And all of a sudden, when the cat thought that the girl was already fast asleep, the animal sprang up, stamped once with its foot, the door swung open, and in a moment, it was gone. The girl did the same. She also sprang to her feet and raced after the cat. The cat ran along a long corridor leading into the castle. There were doors on both sides, but the cat did not enter any of them. When it reached the very last room, it stamped with its foot and entered. The girl followed it in. When she stepped into the room, she saw a door opening in the wall. There were stairs leading downwards. The cat started descending. The girl followed it, and lo and behold, there were magnificent trees on both sides of the stairs. The girl broke two little twigs from each of them, but when the twigs broke, they started jingling, and this caused the cat to turn around. Had she not hidden behind the tree, it would certainly have discovered her. But the cat decided to walk on, and as it went, the girl heard beautiful music coming from down below. When the cat reached a spot, it did a somersault, and when it landed, it had turned into a heartbreakingly handsome young prince. Music was playing, and there were smiling people and great merriment everywhere. The girl observed everything she saw before she finally went back to her room. That evening, the cat returned once again, bringing yet another gemstone in its mouth. It dropped it in front of the girl, the girl pretended not to know a thing about it. You're such a good-for-nothing cat. Where have you been again? You keep escaping from me. But the cat just kept on purring, cajoling the girl. And after a while, the girl said, I know where you've been. I know who you are. I've seen everything. Look at this. This is the proof. The cat let out a scream so loud that all the windows broke. Then it shed its skin 
and the girl was looking at a very handsome young prince standing right in front of her. The cat turned prince said, I was cursed to live as a cat until a girl came and discovered where I was going. Now that you have discovered my secret, I will let you have all of these gemstones. Sell them to a jeweler and use the money to pay for the castle. And so it happened. The girl paid the price for the castle, she married the prince, the wedding feast was grand, and they both lived happily ever after. Hungarian Folk Tales Sebastian the Dragon Slayer Once upon a time there was a poor man and the poor man had three sons. They were so poor that they could not afford to buy even the smallest morsel of food. So they decided to go and see the king and tell him of their misfortune. As they were ambling and rambling along their way, they saw an old shepherd grazing sheep on the hill. The eldest son said, Ah, if these sheep were mine, I would give one to every poor man. The old shepherd replied, Then from this moment on, you shall be the shepherd here, and the sheep shall be yours. The two other youths continued on their journey, and the old man went with them too. They reached a field of hawthorn. The second son said, If only there were vines in this field and not hawthorn, and if only the vines were mine, I would give a vine of plump grapes to every poor man. Then let the field be yours, said the old shepherd. And instead of a field of hawthorn, let it be a vineyard and the second son stayed to tend the vines. The third son continued on his journey with the old shepherd by his side, and soon they arrived at the banks of a broad river. The young man said, if only I were the ferryman here, I would take everyone to the far banks and ask not even for a penny. So the old shepherd agreed and continued on his way home alone. He ambled and rambled along, and soon his path took him winding back to where the first youth stood. You have so many fine sheep, my son, said the old man. Would you give me one? If I gave one of my sheep to everyone who happened by, in the end I would not have a single sheep to my name. The old man gave a wave of his hand, and suddenly the hill turned to stone. Then he continued on his way to meet the second son. What a lovely vineyard you have, dear boy. You could give me a vine or two. I will not give you a vine, not even a cluster of withered grapes. And before he could so much as cast a glance at his vines, the entire vineyard turned into a field of prickly hawthorn. The moon was high in the sky by the time the old shepherd reached the river, where he found the youngest son. He called out to the other side of the river, Come, come across the waters on the ferry. The wife of the ferryman was heavy with child, so the old man had to wait a while, but the youngest brother soon crossed the waters on the ferry. He did not ask as much as a single penny from the old man. Meanwhile, the baby was born, and they asked the old shepherd to be the godfather. By the time the baby had grown to be a boy of seven years old, he already seemed to be a lad of 20. The old man said to him, Now, Sebastian, for this was his name, I will give you a sword, if you tell this sword, 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 sharp and true, mighty sword slices head in two, and it will slice the head from the neck of any foe. 
the boy thanked the old man. And now, said the old man, go to see the king of the nearby lands, for they need as many shepherds there as there are days in the year. But do not ask a high wage, no more than 12 gold coins, a saddle and a horse. Play on the pipes and drive the flock into the rosemary forest and fear nothing. So he went to see the king of the nearby lands. Your majesty, do you have need of a shepherd in your kingdom? Indeed I do, said the king, and he took the boy into his service. Take the flocks out to graze and play the pipes as you watch over them, but do not go over the bridge, for if you do, you will surely meet your death. Sebastian took the flocks out to graze, playing on the pipes. The king watched him from the window. The boy was deep in a rosemary forest. He took off his cloak and spread it out at his feet. Then he took out his pipes and played on them. There was a stream nearby. And as the water rushed and gushed, suddenly a seven-headed dragon emerged from the water. And pray tell, what stray winds have brought you here? Do you seek the unhappy fate of the other shepherds who came here before you? Sebastian took his sword in hand and asked the dragon calmly, why? What fate befell them? Why, if you are so bold to ask, I will show you, roared the dragon, and he charged at the boy. Sebastian lifted the sword above his head and cried out, Sword, sword, sharp and true, mighty sword slice his head in two, and each of the seven heads of the dragon fell with a thud to the ground. The next day, when Sebastian was eating his breakfast, a nine-headed dragon emerged from the waters of the stream, but it fared no better than the seven-headed dragon before it. The king could not fathom what had happened, for until this Sebastian had come along, he had lost a shepherd every day of the year. I will pay it little mine, thought the king. We will wait and see what the fates have in store. Again, Sebastian took the flocks out to graze, and he stopped to have a drink from the stream, when suddenly a twelve-headed dragon emerged from the waters. How dare you come to this place? Sebastian drew his sword. Sword, sword, sharp and true, mighty sword slice his head in two. When the dragon had but a single head remaining on its shoulders, he begged for mercy. Oh, Sebastian, Sebastian the dragon slayer, please leave me with this one head and I swear I will serve you. So Sebastian let the dragon keep the last of its 12 heads. Under the bridge there was an enormous cave and the dragon took Sebastian to its mouth. Sebastian had never seen anything like it before. It was an empire bigger than the realm of the king. There Sebastian found the sheep and the shepherds that had been stolen by the dragons. Come with me to see the king, said Sebastian. And with that, he sliced the dragon's last head off. When he returned to the castle, the king soon realised he was a man of great courage and strength. He gave Sebastian his daughter's hand in marriage, and with it, half of his realm. I accept your daughter's hand in marriage, said Sebastian, but your lands you may keep, for I am a lord of a kingdom even finer than yours. They celebrated their wedding that very day, and they all lived happily ever after.